and I think Mike has some stuff to start with, and we'll go where kind of get it started, and then after that, we'll open it up for folks to ask questions and just kind of you know, share what's going on and, and share some of the stories. Because BSD has been around for 30 years, but BSD has been around far longer. And we, as a community, we have a lot of history. And as a community, we're, it's true that the artifact we produce is a bunch of sorcerers and leeches of such sorcerers. But we're also a bunch of people, and people with individual stories, and we're a bunch of relationships between each other, and that's what makes a community is relationships between people, and our friendships with each other. And hearing our different stories, at least for me, I really enjoy sharing that. What what makes each one of us unique and how it fits into kind of the big picture of previous BSD as a story and BSD as a story. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Thank you. So I have one slide, which is basically the outline. Um, so uh, this is sort of my involvement with BSD of various flavors. Uh, I'm going to start out um, with uh, when I started um, becoming familiar with Unix. Um, I was a grad student in molecular biology at Berkeley. Oh, yes, mask. <laughs> Thank you. And um, so I worked in this lab, which was kind of two parts working on related problems. And one part was bacterial genetics, and that's where I worked. And the highest tech things we used were toothpicks and Petri plates. Um, but uh, the other part of the lab was physical chemistry of the enzyme that the gene we worked on produced. And so they had these various instruments, and they had a PDP-1140 that they used to... Uh, uh, gather data from those instruments. So when I got there, the uh, system was running a sixth edition Unix with some Berkeley changes, which I didn't really know anything about at the time. Um, and I expressed some interest in the computer, so I ended up writing a Fortran program for scientific purposes. Um, and then at one point, the machine started malfunctioning and it would start writing bad blocks on the disk cartridges. Um, but only when it was running Unix. So the hardware people come in, run diagnostics, um, would work fine, would put in the next disk pack, next backup, it would write bad blocks in the middle of it. And at that time, that was fatal. So um, they kept working on the problem. Uh, and I came in one day, and they were running uh, exercises on a disk pack that was unlabeled. And, well, we don't have any unlabeled disk packs. And I found the label on the floor in between the disk rack and the drive, and um, it was our last backup. So uh, basically version 6 was no more on that uh, computer. And we had an undergrad who was maintaining it and decided to put on uh, version 7, or it was actually sort of 2BSD at that time, which I knew nothing about. Uh, so um, this undergrad was a guy named Bill Jolitz, um, which is a name that some of you may have heard. Um, if not, uh, he was the guy who later did the 386 port that was in 4.3 Reno and 4.4, uh, and uh, then later 386 BSD. Uh, so at any rate, we started getting things r running again with this version 7 derived system. Uh, well, it didn't run real well on a PDP-1140. Um, 1140 didn't have separate instruction and data spaces, so it had 64K per program instead of 128K. Uh, so I helped out with putting um, overlays in various programs, things like that. But the other problem was the device drivers for the uh, scientific instruments didn't work, uh, so those had to be ported. Uh, so I ended up working on that, even though I didn't really know what a kernel was before I started. Um, and uh, so with Bill's help, I uh, figured out the device driver stuff. Um, he did some of it, and then I debugged it and fixed things up again. Um, so I ended up 
getting kind of sucked into that stuff. Um, so later worked on a system that was called 2.8 BSD, uh, which one of the earlier systems might have been the first one that had a complete system, including a kernel, um, and the um, and Warner's nodding yes. Um, so before that, the BSD tapes were VI, C shell, Pascal compiler add-ons, uh, basically for Unix systems. Uh, so uh, I got started uh, cutting my, my teeth on basically what was a, an ancestor of 2.8, was sort of the bits du jour from the computer center or from CS department. Um, and later on, I worked on um, a newer version of this uh, called 2.9 BSD, um, which I finally got finished about the time I was supposed to finish my PhD. Um, never did quite finish the PhD, by the way. It's a small matter of writing a thesis, but, but I got my release out. So. Yeah, so after that, I went to CSRG, which was kind of across the mining circle um, in the next building over um, in the com computer science department. Um, at a group called CSRG, a computer systems research group. Um, that was the group that had formed to develop and maintain uh, BSD, which at that time was 4BSD, um, running on the VAX. And uh, so 4.2 BSD was nearly finished when I started. Started over the summer, I've forgotten quite when. This was in um, 1983, I think. And uh, so I um, was learning about VAX Unix. Uh, I was learning about the ARPANET and uh, TCP IP, which I hadn't used yet. And uh, suddenly I was the person in charge of maintaining the TCP code and et cetera for uh, what was about to become the most popular system on the ARPANET. Um, so that was a kind of a rapid learning experience. Um, when I started there, um, in terms of um, HR, I was Bill Joy's replacement, uh, although Bill hadn't been there for a while. He was at Sun, Sun Microsystems. Um, Sam Leffler was there and had uh, basically committed to stay until 4.2 was done. And it was basically nearly done, and I was there to replace him. So I basically replaced um, Bill Joy and Sam Leffler, which was quite a challenge. <laughs> So um, I got started working on TCP code, um, learning it and fixing a few bugs. Uh, and then um, there was this new algorithm that came out from a guy named John Nagel, uh, who worked behind one of the most tortuous paths to the internet I've ever heard of. It was a 4,800 baud least line to a 9,600 baud least line cross country um, to the ARPANET. Um, and so oddly they had problems with congestion uh, and, uh, so John, uh, like some of the better researchers later, said, well, what can I do about this? As opposed to, well, it's hopeless. Um, and he discovered that there are streams of small packets for things like Telnet, uh, for remote logins. Um, and so he came up with an algorithm for coalescing small packets depending on the packet round trip time. So it was kind of self-tuning. And I thought, well, maybe I can you know, implement that. So I went and looked at the previous, at the uh, 4.2 code for TCP and TCP output, and there was this three line conditional. And um, I looked at it very hard and said, I think if I delete the middle conditional, I'll have the Nagel algorithm. Uh, it turned out that was right. Um, so I went, started looking more at what, what other lines can I delete? <laughs> <laughs> So at any rate, um, I, I concentrated quite a bit on the networking code while I was at Berkeley. Um, while later, uh, a guy named Van Jacobson started walking into my office from time to time. And um, he also was looking at congestion. All this time, it was the ARPANET. It was kind of the latter days of the ARPANET. And there were seriously 30, 40 second round trip times on the uh, internet across the ARPANET. Um, and so, like John Nagel before him, he looked at this and said, well, we can do better. Um, traced some connections and looked at queues on gateways and discovered there were a number of retransmissions of the same thing over and over. So we started working on the retransmission code, round trip timing, things like that. And he would walk into my office and show me some new code and we'd try it out and I'd put it in 
the, the current working Berkeley version. Um, later on, after uh, 4.3 came out, um, then he developed some new algorithms uh, called slow start, a congestion avoidance algorithm that goes with it. Um, and those were extremely successful um, to the point that the IETF basically mandated them a few months after they were released, more or less. Uh, so um, that was part of what I worked on at Berkeley. Um, I got to work on some other things that were less fun, like uh, DNS, uh, which is brand new. Um, there was a version of DNS done at Berkeley called Bind, Berkeley Internet Name Domain System. And uh, it was done by a group of graduate students, three master's students, if I recall correctly, and one PhD student directing things, although he didn't write any code. Uh, and so then I went to a meeting where they kind of presented their, okay, it's all working, we're, you know, ready to go. And the guy said, who did the memory allocation part for the database said, well, he always run, wanted to run a garbage collector, write a garbage collector. So um, he decided he would have 17 byte buckets and uh, not reference count or anything or, you know, keep track of it. So he could just write his garbage collector. I was like, okay, you know, this will be good. Uh, needless to say, the program needed a little work when we got it, so I ended up working on that some. Uh, this was also the time of uh, Internet host requirements um, in the IETF, um, and so I ended up going to a lot of IETF and POSIX meetings, um, and this was probably a good thing, but at some point I realized that I was going to three or four meetings a year for each of them, and they were a week each. And then the week before was mostly prep, and the week after was catching up. And that was six months out of my year. So I decided I would start going to every other meeting, since the stuff I cared about the most had been finished. Um, and uh, what this really meant in practice was, I won't go to this meeting, maybe I'll go to the next one. So I went to very few after that. Um, so we did a number of 4BSD releases um, during that time. Uh, and these were all complete Unix-based systems uh, with the more and more Berkeley modifications. Uh, for example, in 4.3, Reno had a new virtual memory system from Mach, um, which was ported by Mike Hibbler at University of Utah. Uh, so uh, various people would call up from time to time and ask about certain parts of the system. Um, I specifically remember a call from Wind River Systems um, who wanted to know about our Telnet client, maybe the server, um, but they're mostly interested in the client, I think. They wanted to know if it was based on Unix code, and I said, well, I don't think so, I don't know. He said, well, can we get a copy of it? And I said, no, we don't do partial releases. We just you know, have a license for the whole thing, uh, and that requires a Unix license, which they didn't have. So after some number of these calls, I decided, well, maybe it would be a good idea to see if these things were based on Unix code. And we looked at some of them, and we would find little bits of things derived from like CU or something like that. It's a predecessor to TIP. Um, and so we'd fix that up, rewrite it, and usually do it much more modern way. Uh, and so eventually we put together a release called the first Berkeley Network, well, the Berkeley Networking Release. Um, and that was available with a license but it didn't require a Unix license. You just signed a license with the university and um, had some terms and conditions and things. Um, and uh, then you could get this without a Unix license and unit, use it for more or less, more or less whatever you wanted. Um, and so we started releasing what was basically a vertical stack, vertical slice through the stack. Uh, it had clients, um, it had some networking code, I think the TCP and IP code were there don't remember if it had any device drivers or not. Um, was not usable by itself, obviously. And once we got started on that, um, this kind of rolled along and gathered momentum. Um, and Keith Bostick started at the university and started getting people to rewrite various user level code. Um, so we had an unencumbered version of CAT, unencumbered version of LS, and all the hard ones got written. Uh, but he kept working on it and getting more and more people involved. And we also started looking at the kernel code. Um, he put together uh, some tools to look for common code between 
32V, which was the version of Unix that Vax Unix was based on, um, and our current then code, which was um, about Tahoe vintage, I think. And he found things that would match that you would never imagine. For example, um, there was a kernel profiling clock driver called uh, KG Mon, um, and you would never guess that that was derived from 32V, which didn't have such a thing. But it turned out the way it worked was it hooked up to a single port serial card, and it set it for, I think it was 1200 baud with two stop bits, and then it would transmit at 109 interrupts per second. And so we would just transmit continuously nulls, and that was our 109 hertz profiling clock. Uh, and so we looked at that and said, well, this is derived from the console driver. Um, and you would never guess that if you didn't know the history of it or have this program that uh, Keith, Keith put together. Um, so we gradually filtered out which parts of the system had free software and which parts had encumbered software. So eventually, this came out as the Net2 release, or second Berkeley networking release. And by that time, we had kind of overshot where we wanted to be with the second iteration on this. Um, it, was, it turned out it was most of the kernel. Uh, I think there were seven files missing from the kernel, um, which still were encumbered. Uh, but we looked at various parts of the code, and it's like, OK, there's a bunch of lines of code in Fork that copy this, that, and the other thing from the parent process to the child process. And I looked at it and I said, you know, I've always hated that code. I wanted to rewrite it anyway. Um, instead of zeroing half the fields one at a time, why not group them and just be zero all the things that were supposed to be zero, and then have the other things in a block that you'd copy, and then a third block of things that you would initialize individually. Um, and so we put that in, and then, ta-da. Keith's program produced no commonality between our version of Fork and the 32V version of Fork. So it wasn't just a matter of getting rid of licensed code. It was sometimes getting rid of some of the oldest and most obsolete code in the system. Um, so uh, there were quite a few utilities, uh, uh, various parts of the user program, uh, all the networking utilities, obviously, by that time. Uh, and so I was a little bit afraid that we had gotten ahead of ourselves. Um, I wanted to come up with new releases with gradually more and more stuff uh, so that AT&T or USL would not be too surprised if somebody came out with a free version of the operating system that actually ran. And we came perilously close to doing that with Net2. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I guess there was one other thing I wanted to, oh, two other things I wanted to mention about my time at Berkeley. Uh, one was the origins of the uh, Berkeley copyright, um, with, in particular the license notice that's with the copyright notice in the files. Um, in 4.2 BSD, there were no copyright notices at all. Uh, 32V was protected by trade secret. Um, BSD was subject to the 32V license, so it was kind of, transitive in a way, um, but I looked at a certain company's version of 4.2 BSD and a file that they had modified in two ways. Somebody had added a comment saying, I don't understand this, <laughs> and they had added their copyright. And you look at it and you say, this looks like it was developed by this other company, when in fact it was developed by Berkeley. So I got annoyed at this. Uh, talked to the Berkeley lawyers eventually, and we decided to do what's called a copyright recapture. We put copyright notices in the files and then send out notices to the 4.2 licensees saying, we inadvertently shipped these you know, 10,000 files without copyright notices. You know, Please put them in, um, which, of course, we had done. Um, so we managed to do this, I think it was for 4.3 BSD, got the timing such that the new release was out, and then we could say, you know, edit in this license notice into these, this list of files attached, or upgrade to the new release. Um, so that was a little more palatable. Um, so it was a, an iterative process developing this license. Um, it got longer and longer the more times I talked to the lawyers about it. And then, uh, you know, and they oh yeah, we have to put this paragraph in with no license or um, 
indemnification, um, and it has to be all in caps. <laughs> Why? Well, that's the established legal tradition. So we uh, put that in. Keith Bostick was the one who put the copyright notices into the 10,000 or so files. Um, and after doing it a couple of times, he decided enough is enough. He would put a percent copyright percent or something like that into the sources and then have RCS insert it. So uh, it was no big deal then making the changes to the license. So um, I don't know how many people know it, but I'll actually take credit for the uh, BSG license. Uh, oh, and one other thing. Uh, um, uh, there were a number of things that we added during that time frame, um, things like disc labels and Malik and Kirk being most of Malik um, and various things like that. Um, one thing that I added, which was just kind of a small fraction of what it is now, is Syskittle. Um, and I had no idea where it was going to go, um, but it seemed like having an extensible interface would be a good thing. So uh, in general, looking back at those systems, um, they were still very primitive by current standards, um, but I think we made a certain amount of progress in uh, making them a little more modern. At any rate, around the time that 4.3 Reno came out, 4.4 was making good progress, and Net2 is out. Um, a little company called BSDI, Berkeley Software Design, started up and um, had two employees um, who proceeded to fill in the seven missing files from the kernel for Net2, um, got the thing booting and running, and um, started developing drivers and other things. And before long, um, I was talking to the um, head of that company, the president, and uh, he said, we need a system architect, and it's now or never. So I decided, well, this sounds like fun, and they would let me live wherever I wanted, because um, it was associated with UUNet. They had networking everywhere, pretty much, or they'd put it everywhere. Um, and so I went to work for BSDI um, as the chief system architect, um, he insisted that it had to be chief system architect because when they were going out talking to venture capitalists, they wouldn't necessarily understand that there was just one system architect. So a system with seven employees had a chief system architect. <laughs> uh, so uh, there was some stuff that you have probably heard about that uh, happened not long after that. Um, one of the things that may have instigated it was that BSDI started advertising this complete uh, B BSD system that run and you could get source code, and it was available at nominal charge, including with source code. Uh, nominal charge went 500 or 1,000, 500, I think, for binaries and 1,000, including source. Um, there was one little problem in the ads. Um, the 800 number that you would call for information was 1-800-ITS-UNIX. Um, now, he, he was smart. He talked to the lawyers ahead of time and said, is this defensible? And he showed him some materials that he had. Um, and uh, the lawyers looked at it and said, yeah, it's defensible. He forgot to ask the second question, how much will it cost to defend it? <laughs> <laughs> so needless to say, there was this little lawsuit. Um, USL filed suit against BSDI for a, a number of things. Uh, but mostly for releasing their proprietary source code, trade secret source code. Um, there's one little issue. BSDI didn't do that. Berkeley did, UC Berkeley. So about the time we were hopefully going to have the suit thrown out because we didn't do the thing they were alleging, um, they refiled the suit against UC Berkeley as well as us. Um, and so the next couple of years were... Um, interesting as the lawsuit proceeded. Um, and I think Kirk has talked and written about it a lot more than I have. He was more on the inside because the university um, could see various things that we couldn't. So let's see. What else did I want to mention? So BSDI did, I think, the first commercially supported BSD system. Um, did a lot of drivers and various other things. And gradually system grew uh, to be relatively advanced for its time. Um, and then we got some pressure from customers and people who wanted to use it for development. 
um, to do multiprocessing, because you can now buy these PCs with two processors. And um, so this seemed, you know, plausible. Um, we had some contractors uh, who wanted to do it, and we didn't have time. So they did a, an initial version, which was mostly asymmetric. Um, so there was ma kind of a master-slave. Either kernel could run, either system could run in the kernel, but only one at a time. The other one could just run user code. Uh, so then we took that internally and uh, gradually developed it, and got the first 80% or so of the project done to the point that it was up and running, and uh, a lot of the kernel was multi-threaded. Um, and then there were various interesting things going on, including um, talks of um, open source software and how we could collaborate with open source. And so for various and sundry reasons, uh, BSGI agreed to give the multiprocessing code to FreeBSD, um, which was a, I thought, nice contribution. Um, and so FreeBSD then picked this up, got it put in, and discovered that there were still some more things that there were to be done. So FreeBSD has gotten the next 90% done. Um, so now there's just 90% left, I guess. <laughs> but in fact, it's uh, really made quite a lot of progress. Uh, so my next job was not really um, affiliated with BST, um, but it did use BST, and so there were a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, I went to work for a firewall company called uh, Secure Computing Corporation, which happened to be in Minneapolis, which is where I worked and lived. Uh, and uh, they had a, a firewall called Sidewinder. Um, it was based on BST OS, as it was called at the time. and uh, so I went to work for them. Um, they were getting their stuff working with multiprocessing. They had some kernel code. Uh, but about this time, um, and they didn't know it at, at first, uh, but the, the BSDI uh, code base wasn't going forward. Um, the company that had acquired the software assets um, had decided they didn't know what they were doing. At least this is my understanding. Um, and so they decided to just say, OK, we're now finished with the SMP version. Um, here's the 5.0, 5.1 releases, and you're on your own. Um, so this was not what Secure Computing wanted to hear, but FreeBSD was working on it. So they needed a new operating system for um, their firewalls, and I was available to help work on it. So um, I worked for them. Uh, it was actually a succession of companies um, all of the same group, same product, um, which were uh, Secure Computing, and they were acquired by McAfee. Um, they became Intel Security and acquired by Intel. Um, and then Intel took them internally, or that group internally, um, and then Intel spun it off to Forcepoint, where I worked until a year and a half ago. Um, so a couple of things worth mentioning. Um, one is that it was a highly secure system. It had a thing called type enforcement, uh, which they had patented and uh, were the only ones to have for some time. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's a predecessor of SE Linux. Uh, so type enforcement means that um, ob objects have types and creators. Uh, creators kind of like an owner, but it's the owner's security group. Uh, and then processes have roles, um, which are the... Um, creator type for the objects they produce. And there's a database um, which was statically compiled ahead of time um, which said who can do what to what, um, including can you fork? Can you exec this other domain? Can you exec that domain? Um, can you um, elevate yourself to this domain? Can you run the startup software? No. Um, can you modify the disk? No. Um, and so it was really a very secure system. And uh, that was something that, of course, had to be preserved when going from BSDOS into FreeBSD system. Um, fortunately, at this time, the Mac framework was out. Um, and so we put this mostly into the Mac framework by writing a TE module for the Mac framework. Uh, and that did most of the work. Um, and so we ended up having a few if defs for um, if you have type enforcement, then make this extra call if somehow the Mac framework didn't have what we needed. Um, but there were relatively few of those. Um, so that was um, 
and fairly fun. Uh, there was a little talk of releasing that code. Um, Robert Watson asked about it at one point. Um, he had developed the Mac framework um, and uh, was interested in having some serious examples of how to use it. Um, and he had gotten little bits of code from us for some modifications we had made to the framework. Um, but unfortunately, I never got to push that through. But there was some code, like TCP improvements, that did make it from secure computing and successors uh, into FreeBSD. Uh, for example, we modified TCP so that it could use the same port for connections to multiple destinations, um, which it didn't initially do. Um, and so um, I packaged some of those things up, sent them off to George Neville Neal, who I knew from a previous life or two. Um, and uh, so he he would have some questions, and, and I think I gave him diffs against FreeBSD. So it was you know sort of like a pull request, except in email. Um, so uh, George got tired of putting in things for me, um, and so um, he decided I should become a committer. So I finally became a FreeBSD committer in 2017, um, which, given the lifetime of FreeBSD and length of time I'd been using it, was probably a little late. But. <laughs> so in any case, um, I retired about a year and a half ago, uh, and so now I've had more time for FreeBSD, although not as much as I thought I would. Uh, so um, I've been cleaning up various things, uh, sort of cleaning up messes that I'd left at Berkeley <laughs> some time before. Uh, for example, the class A and B and C network code uh, masks and shifts to break things apart. And there was a bunch of code that would say, well, looking at an address, treat it as a class A address, and then see if the network number is 127. Um, if so, then it's loopback. Um, it's like, well, you know, somebody had already added a is it loopback macro. That would be much nicer to have in user programs. So uh, I spent a little time cleaning up that sort of thing. Um, so um, I had, had been doing some FreeBSD work before I retired. Um, one example is the GE net driver, Ethernet driver for the Raspberry Pi 4, um, which I uh, cribbed mostly from NetBSD after attempting to do it on my own and discovering that, um, well, I knew this, but um, doing uh, drivers without hardware documentation is painful, even if you have other examples. Um, so um, looking at the NetBSD code, it's like, well, okay, here's a series of, co of uh, calls to initialize the chip. And, you know, I thought I was doing something pretty much equivalent, but why not put in exactly that sequence? And lo and behold, it worked. So um, debugged once is you know, ready to pick from. So uh, lately, I've uh, done a handful of uh, other cleanups. Dirk was commenting that um, I seem to be working on a lot of different things. That seemed to be true. Um, I had a couple of larger projects that I started on. They've both been pretty much on hold lately. Um, one is um, helping out with the uh, port to the Mac Mini with the M1 chip. Uh, Kyle Evans has been working on that, and I worked on various bits of that code. Um, and um, interested in getting back to it now that he's made some good progress. Um, and also, I thought it was interesting that Intel had two different kinds of CPU cores in some of their newer chips, and performance cores and efficiency cores got mentioned in Mark's um, session this morning. Uh, and so I started looking at that, decided to um, build a system based on one of those chips. And I have some bits of code that do some of what I want, but it still doesn't work well enough with the rest of the ULE framework. So there's a lot left to be done there. And um, part of the problem is not just to push things to the performance cores, but put the appropriate things on the efficiency cores. And it's kind of different on Intel, as far as I can tell. It's not really about efficiency. It's just lower performance and <laughs> shared caches. Um, but it, it turns out those cores are still faster than putting a second thread on a um, performance core. So it's kind of a three-level hierarchy now. You've got performance core running one thread, then the efficiency core, 
and then the performance core running a second thread. Um, and so um, I'm hoping to get back to that as well and want it to be generic, so I want it to work on the Intel chips and on ARMS, including the Mac Mini at some point. So um, I think with that, I'll open it to questions. Oh, a question. I don't know that it's okay. Um, how did you get involved with working on? I think it's the four four book you are a co-author on, right? For which? Uh, the the D, the four four DNI book. Or the four three. Sorry, the I design think implement my ears are not good. That's okay. The the design implementation of BSD book. How was what was that like to get involved with that? How did or how did you get roped into that? Um, working on that project and maybe which parts of the like which chapters if you remember did you work on? Um, well, let's see. In the four three book, I did uh, network related stuff, in particular the TCP chapter. Um, there were a couple of chapters, um, sort of lined up for the networking framework, socket layer, and things like that, which Sam wrote, uh, but. I decided that there really needed to be a, a chapter about TCP itself as an example implementation, even though it was supposed to be a generalized framework. And then I think I wrote the TTY chapter because nobody wanted to do it. And uh, I forgot something else. Um, and then with 4.4 book, um, I've sort of forgotten. I know I updated the TCP chapters uh, chapter. Um, I forgot what else I did in the 4.4 book. Do you remember? That was a long time ago. That was three books ago. Yeah, not for me. It wasn't three books ago for me, but um, it's still a long time ago. So, um, yeah, I, there had been talk about doing a book for a long time. There was talk about doing a book about 4.2. Um, and somebody talked to, I think it was Addison Wesley. Um, yeah, and... Um, and um, they approached USL and said, you know, Berkeley, some Berkeley people would like to write a book about 4.2. Would you approve it? And they said, well, write the book and then we'll tell you. <laughs> Needless to say, the book didn't get written. Ah, good point. Okay, so there was this nice progression of releases, um, 4.0 BSD, or I think it was just called 4 BSD, then 4.1 BSD, 4.2 BSD, 4.3, which came out somewhat later for interesting reasons that had to do with the funding agency. Um, and then um, there was a planned 4.4 BSD, uh, which eventually came out, but it was going to have a new VM system, which it did. But when we came out with Tahoe, there was no new VM system. There were various other things that um, we wanted to have in 4.4. So um, since we were only some fraction of the way through the design, um, we decided we'd put out a, an incremental release. And among other things, it ran on some new hardware. Um, 4.2 ran on one platform. Um, well, 4.2 as you got it from Berkeley ran on one platform, which was the VAX. Uh, now, it so happened that it also ran on Sun platforms, and they used similar source code organization, and source code organization was set up for multiple architectures. But we wanted a uh, proof in the BSD release, um, and so uh, we got started on a platform called the CCI Power 6, um, which was kind of the uh, VAX killer of its time. and the code name for that was Tahoe. It was the if def's um, macro was if def Tahoe. So um, we called it the Tahoe release. We didn't want to call it the CCI release of, any more than we called the original the um, VAX or the um, Digital, like, Digital um, Equipment Corporation release. So we called this release 4.3 Tahoe because that was the biggest new feature in it. And it was kind of a 
well, it's part way through. Um, and so it's not quite 4.4 yet, but um, we'll continue. Um, 4.3 Reno um, sounds slightly analogous if you know your Northern California geography. Um, Lake Tahoe and Reno are not far apart, um, but it, it's different um, derivation entirely. 4.4 um, was not done um, still, but the new VM system was in and working. Um, and we had gotten some funding that included a string that, um, well, you know, they could get incremental releases um, to look at, but they couldn't ship them, um, except that we said, well, whatever we ship by this date, you can ship it. Um, and so when that date was about to arrive, we decided, okay, it's time for a release. Um, didn't want to release it to just one funding organization. Um, so the idea was that it was not 4.4 yet, had some new features, it wasn't done. Um, so if you wanted to run in production, it would be a gamble. Well, you go to Lake Tahoe, it's probably for skiing, then you go across the border into Nevada for, to Reno, and that's where you do your gambling. So that was the derivation of the name 4.4 Reno. Um, and then 4.3 Reno. So um, obviously 4.4 came out eventually, and then 4.4 Lite. Warner? Just a, a quick follow-up. Uh, you said Power 6. Does that have anything to do with PowerPC stuff later, or it was just Power 6 because it was cool? Um, I don't know where they came up with the name, but it was not related to PowerPC. Um, I never looked at the instruction set carefully, but I've heard that it's sort of the VAX instruction set byte-swapped. Um, oh, and, and it was um, opposite byte order, if I recall correctly. Um, and other than that, it was very VAX-like. VAX had three memory regions, um, which we used for user stack. Then there was an unused area, which was used for supervisor and VMS, um, and then the kernel area. Well, they had three user areas plus kernel. So it was a very VAX-like architecture. Uh, it was VME bus. Um, I think it was VME. Um, so. Uh, it was a good next step for BSD, and it was quite a bit faster than the VAXs we had. Um, and the company was very cooperative. They gave us their 4.2 port. Um, we ended up rewriting more drivers than we cared to when we brought it in, but um, <clears throat> it was still a pretty solid machine, and it was the basis for most of our work for quite a while. And then uh, 68,000 port got done at some point. Um, I think HP did that and contributed it, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I think so. The, there's all kinds of HP support in the 4.4 sources, so. Yeah. Well, sometimes with, with when HP you copyrights. Uh, put something in to, to show that something is general enough, it's almost but not quite general enough. So there were remaining IFDEF, Tahoe's, sort of scattered around. But usually if we had the time, we would sort of split things out into a machine-dependent function, and even if it was a small function. Um, so most of those things got done in a reasonably good way. But um, when you're trying to um, engineer software and do a little research at the same time, it's kind of hard to do both. So rather than um, sort of f finish every last bit um, in terms of production quality and making it all look nice, Sometimes it was like, well, let's get this other driver done. So it's, even in a university, it can be pragmatic sometimes. True, true. I, I always wondered why there wasn't another town in Nevada that you had uh, named the release after. <laughs> uh, you know, um, a 4.3 four, a four, BSD Elkhart or something, you know. But I, I don't know how to tie that back in. Well, there wasn't another release uh, or a good time to do a release, I don't think, between... 4.3 Reno and 4.4, uh, and the lawsuit intervened in there at some point. But Yeah, it was after 4.4, the first one came out, because then you guys did 4.4 Lite to get rid of the files that the lawsuit objected to or to put the right, right. markings on the files that yeah, I wasn't wanted. in on those negotiations, but yeah. um, since I couldn't look at the original code anymore, <laughs> since I didn't have a Unix license. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs>
So I have a question from IRC. Um, uh, Daniel asks, uh, does Mike remember if any of the folks involved with the TCP implementation in Linux, and then he gives some names, um, of Fred Van Kempen, Mark Evans, Corey Minyard, and Florian at La Roche, I'm going to butcher the name. Um, if they ever got in contact with you, I guess he's trying to ask how much um, Linux's TCP IP stack might have been kind of be a descendant of or influenced by the BSD stack, so you're, as far as you're aware. Um, I don't remember any contact um, with Linux people, um, other than I ran into one or two of them at conferences sometimes. Um, um, I didn't even spend the time to look at the Linux code when it first came out, um, see what it looked like. Um, I don't, that, that was, a lot of that was during the time of the lawsuit. And um, I, I know that some other places, apparently including Microsoft, had strict rules that people should not look at Berkeley code during the time of the lawsuit, even though there was no dispute about, say, TCP. Um, so uh, and eventually I became convinced that they really, but it sure had the look and feel in some cases, uh, like the Telnet client and things like that. Sure seemed to act like the Berkeley one, but uh, um, but in terms of Linux, no, I, I'm not sure what yeah. they looked at. I don't know if it became the Linux TCP client, but I do know there was a four three um, TCP port to Linux at one point or in the early days. Mm -hmm. It crashed like hell all the time, so I didn't run it much. And there was another, like University of, of Uppsala or something else that would eventually become the descendant of that, would eventually be the TCP stack in Linux. And I ran mm -hmm. that and it was more solid. But the user land stuff seemed to be more Berkeley ports than the actual stuff in the kernel. Mm -hmm. When all the dust shook out, there's some interesting... Uh, there was at least one uh, flame war about, you know, hey, you took my code and sawed off my copyrights and tried to pass it off as your own with, <laughs> the, with the original Berkeley port. And I, at the time, couldn't evaluate that one way or the other. But it, mm. it was uh, a lot of acrimony at the time. And yeah. I don't know if it was legit or for other reasons. Mm. You, you know, I mean, this is a legit IP complaint or these two people hate each other and they're using this code is an excuse to argue, which happened a lot in the uh, Linux BSD wars of the time. So, BSD TCP code has been in a lot of interesting places. Um, what, what's the most interesting place? Um, the most interesting one that I was personally involved with um, was, um, I, I mentioned uh, secure computing and its successors, um, and at one of them, I forget which one, um, they bought another firewall company uh, called Stonesoft, uh, which was very big in the European market. Um, it was based on Linux and um, had this big kernel module you plugged in to do a lot of security-related stuff. Um, and um, I ended up working on that system a little bit. Um, but one of the things that we did is to port some Sidewinder features to it. Um, once they announced end of sale of Sidewinder, um, they wanted to pull people into their other firewall. Um, and so we uh, ported the proxy framework, and the proxy framework had some hacks in TCP. Well, they didn't do hacks in TCP in Linux. Um, they had all their stuff in this kernel module. So um, I ported the TCP into user mode in Linux. Um, it was linked with the uh, proxy code. Um, and due to some package sharing between the kernel and user space, it didn't really involve any unnecessary copying. Um, but it, it was in VAX VMS um, and uh, Wollongong and other systems. Uh, some of it was in uh, Wind River. I worked at Wollongong on their TCP IP product for VMS. Thankfully not Eunice, but as close as I got. <laughs> which the code was kind of crazy bolted in in weird ways so yep I, I had occasion to look at some of it as an expert system in a um, well it was a lawsuit but it was settled in arbitration but 
I got pulled in as an expert witness and ended up doing a bunch of research for them, uh, researching the source code and stuff. Eventually, it turned out that it was decided based on licensing. Uh, but I had to figure out how to explain similarity between two pieces of code to some arbitrators. And so I kept coming up with, you know, like diff minus uh, D, um, show if deft code. And the lawyer said, no, they'll never understand it. Finally came up with something. Um, I printed one, put inserted spaces into the code. Right. I printed one of them in blue, one in red, and then superimposed them in a bunch of it turned purple. Um, so they thought the arbitrators would actually understand that. But it turned out to have nothing with how this case was decided. So when all the you know, the BSD copyright uh, notice was being designed, the uh, it just kept getting longer and longer and longer. And at some point, it was going to be like two pages. And especially in those days where a lot of these things would be printed out, you'd have a header file that was half a page long, and then you're going to have two pages of copyright. And I remember at some point, you going into the lawyers and having a temper tantrum and saying, you've got to get this down to half a page maximum. And somehow, <laughs> you made that stick. Yeah, um, I wasn't very happy about it either. Um, I do remember one day when I was on the phone with the lawyers, and uh, they would wanted some things added. And I hung up the phone and um, let go with a loud expletive. And a couple of people came running and said, what, what's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, just that I talked to the lawyers and they, oh, yeah, we have to add this. So they, they loved adding things. And, but, and you managed to talk them down to, you know, I remember you had the thing on your desk and you were like marking stuff out, like we don't need this and this and this and this. And finally, yep. down to that thing and somehow got to the blue book. Right yep. Yeah, the, the part that, um, they didn't modify was the uh, list of terms and conditions, um, which included two clauses that people claim were contradictory. Uh, one was the advertising clause, um, and one, one of them said you had to uh, mention it. The products mentioning features or use in advertising you had to say that it was um, Berkeley code derived, um, but then it was you can't use the name of the university. Um, so it, yeah. I, th I should have said, except according to, you know, whatever. But I never saw anybody mentioning things like that in ads anyway, so it was a moot point. Um, so it was fine when they decided to get rid of what was it, Clause 3. And that was the advertising clause they got rid of, right? <laughs> was that your doing or was that somebody else's um, doing? Um, that was my doing. I mean, the lawyers had approved it. But... Oh, you mean getting rid of it? <laughs> getting rid of it. Um, no, I was gone from Berkeley at that oh, time. Oh, okay. I don't know if Kirk was involved or not. Um, yeah, there was a, a guy in charge of licensing and things like that. I've forgotten exactly what he did. Um, Who's the guy who had to sign off on that kind of stuff? And uh, so it was a little tricky getting him to understand what we were doing um, for some time. But he was fairly reasonable once you... You know, explain to him what we were trying to accomplish. Um, in this case, we were trying to get due credit to Berkeley, even if other companies modified the code and say, I don't understand this, and added their copyright. Can you tell us something about the development of uh, UDP? Get a little closer. Yeah. That doesn't feed into the room, just into the... The people on, at home can hear you, but... Okay. Um, 
Can you tell us something about UDP? Was it developed, uh, yeah, together with TCP, or was it completely different people? Have you been involved with it? Um, the question is about um, UDP, whether it was developed by different people than TCP, uh, or if it was done at the same time. Um, as far as I know, they were um, always in the system in parallel. Um, that actually sort of gets into the background for um, why 4.3 was delayed. Uh, the, there was a company called BBN, Volt, Baranek, and Newman, that was under contract to DARPA to develop the TCP IP code for BSD. Um, and Berkeley was under contract to do the socket framework and various other things um, in 4.2. And so Berkeley got a pre-release. This, this is before I was at Berkeley. Well, before I was in the CS department. Um, Berkeley got a pre-release from BBN of the TCP code, and I assume UDP came with it at the time. Um, they were all side by side, as far as I know. Um, and it worked, but there were some issues. It was done as kind of a formal state machine. Um, so there was a state and indirect calls into a state machine. And um, performance was not great. Um, there was a certain amount of copying involved, which of, of course is not the best way to, uh, not the only way to make your networking code slow, um, but it's the easiest. <laughs> 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 um, so, um, Bill Joy in particular, and later Sam, uh, spent a fair amount of time optimizing the TCP code, rewriting things, um, making it turn into case statements instead of indirect calls, and coalescing common code, things like that. Um, and they made a bunch of changes to MBUFFs, which are the buffers that are used by the network stack, um, so that it would be easier to do things without copying. Um, and without having a whole chain of little things for a big packet. Um, so they added clusters and trailer encapsulations, if you remember those. Um, so then, sometime later, BBN came back and said, okay, we're done with the TCP IP code that DARPA contracted for. And Berkeley said, um, no thanks, we've got one we like. Um, so there was a certain amount of bad blood. and. At the time, 4.3 was nearly finished. Um, we met with DARPA, as happened periodically. And DARPA said, well, about this other code, we paid for it. We want you to ship it. And we said, well, there's some problems with that. <laughs> um, so there was a certain controversy. And DARPA decided to do a sort of a bake-off. Bake and. Uh, there was a guy at the Ballistic Research Labs, um, which is an uh, army site, who used BSD. And so he did a bunch of tests and said, well, in this particular performance test, the BBN code was ahead, but the BSD code caught up while the BBN code was rebooting. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of the end of it. Um, but it probably delayed 4.3 by a year or more. Um, other stuff got done, so it was a better release, but it wasn't what we wanted to spend our time waiting for. Yeah. Thank you. Can you tell some more about uh, BSDI and BSDOS? How many people were working on, on this? BSDI? Yeah, yeah. And um, well, it's, uh, when I uh, started at BSDI, it was seven people, all engineers. Um, well, no, I guess there was one manager by then. I guess he started just before I did. Um, and. Uh, I'm not sure how many people it was when I left. Um, it included salespeople and marketing and um, quite a few staff um, in the office to process orders, support people. Um, I think there were about 20 engineers um, by the time BSDI as a software organization ended, um, and probably 30, 35 or so 
in the company. Um, we did quite a bit with what we had. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Um, I can't really think of much um, that happened between BSGI and FreeBSD. Um, I was busy with the BSGI stuff and wasn't really paying attention to FreeBSD. Um, I would guess that the FreeBSD people probably figured that we weren't getting paid to help them. So um, basically, at the time, it was like, well, we're going to do a commercial version commercially supported, but you can get source code for a reasonable price. And they were aimed at um, embedded systems, high-end embedded systems, like the Sidewinder firewall or things like that. Um, so I think we were aiming for somewhat different markets, but uh, people probably know the story of um, uh, 386 BSD, but um, it turns out the guy who did 386BSD, Bill Jolitz that I mentioned, uh, was actually one of the original BSDI employees. And they came to a parting of the ways. Um, and then John is laughing. He's heard something. <laughs> um, but um, so he decided that he was also going to fill in the missing seven kernel files and produce a running system and make it free. So. And of course, it was inevitable that such a thing would happen. And the barrier to entry was not that large. Although, for example, um, one of the files that was missing was, I forgot what it's called now, but it was basically the buffer cache. Um, and so he filled it in with a buffer cache that didn't cache, but you could read through. Um, so it was very, very simple at first. Um, but then other things like, um, well, there was a, a patch kit which eventually turned into NetBSD when Bill was not br bringing patches back in. So NetBSD sprang up, and then FreeBSD, and much later, OpenBSD. Um, so there was, unfortunately, a certain amount of fragmentation in the BSD market. But different people have different goals and different personalities. And... But yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of much crosstalk between um, BSDI and FreeBSD. Uh, until, um, well, I wasn't involved in most of this, but um, basically um, BSDI uh, bought um, Walnut Creek CD-ROM, um, which was involved with, with FreeBSD. And this is when they were you know, sort of talking about open source and trying to figure out how they wanted to relate to open source. So we actually had people working for the same company um, who worked on FreeBSD, um, but that was still fairly much at arm's length. Um, and so, um, and there was continuing discussions internally on you know, what things should we give away, what things should remain proprietary. Um, and it was possible that we might have done something that was more like, um, oh, I forgot the name of the company now, um, that did, um, Linux with support um, and hardware. Um, and uh, so uh, BSDI actually bought a hardware company, which uh, was known as IX Systems. Um, and then, and then um, after a while, due to various and sundry reasons, sold the software uh, division to Wind River, uh, which thought they were buying FreeBSD. Side of that merger, and this was, I don't know what Wind River thought they were doing with these mines case, but then um, they got rid of us first <laughs> pretty quickly after the merger. Um, although I don't know that they were very kind to BSDI long term, but uh, yeah. I, I do recall one story from those days um, from the Walnut Creek CD ROM side. We, we did have some interesting discussions between the OS teams. I think you're one of the nice people, <laughs> but I. There was one person, I think, who might have put a Powered by FreeBSD sticker in a rather indiscreet location um, in his home um, as a form of not liking FreeBSD, but that was definitely not you. <laughs>
There was some tension, I think, between the teams. Uh, that is the one we got the drop on Builder, the uh, the drop of BSUS 5.0 that really helped us out. Um, that was very generous of you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, we really appreciated that. Yeah, so there was sort of confusion all around as far as I could tell. Um, but I didn't find out until later that Wind River thought they were buying FreeBSD. Um, they were buying, you know, yes, yeah. what had come from uh, Walnut Creek CD-ROM, um, but they didn't fully understand there were two complete systems there, I think. Uh, actually, there's one guy who did, and I think he's the guy who pushed the sale through, and he might have been gone not long after that. Oh, I, I might know who you're, yeah. Um, okay. I can't remember his name now. It's Tom something. I should. Or, It'll come to me later yeah. today. It's interesting because from my, what I felt like, on the other side is we actually felt like Wind River understood BSD US better because of it being commercial as opposed to open source. And that when they bought FreeBSD, they really had no idea what they to do with an open source operating system or how to monetize that. Right. Um, but I guess they actually probably didn't know what to do with either one of those. Yes. <laughs> so the hardware company ended up, I, I guess it was spun off or something. Yeah, because I think uh, it was systems called Telenet before. When it was when 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 the three of us merged, I think they were called Telnet, and then when they got spun out, that's when they got called IX Systems, I think, um, maybe. Yeah, all, all I know is that after I left, there were some lawsuits, and they managed <laughs> to use up most of the remaining assets of the company. The lawyers got it all, um, <laughs> and eventually got a check, which was a threefold return on my investment for ten years of work, <laughs> um, and it wasn't that big of an investment, so it wasn't that big a return. John, I think the natives will like this. When many people try a system from scratch, this is where I was told when I started. Well, there's, um, I won't go into it here. There were some interesting non technical people in the company, one of whom ended up at IX Systems. Um, so I remember the chain. Well, there's more stories. You won't tell those stories, <laughs> especially not on a recorded medium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything else on IRC? Um, well, Mateus in the room doesn't want to walk out and use the mic. Um, <laughs> he can ask his question directly. <laughs> um, so I have a question regarding the release names. Why would you use a slash in a release name if you cannot use it in a file name? Uh, in slash and what? Like BSD slash OS. It looks like a very annoying oh. file name. Um, I hadn't actually thought about that. <laughs> if, if anybody couldn't hear it in the room, uh, the question is why I'd use a slash in the name of a system like BSD. Well, it was originally BSD slash 386 um, and uh, later BSD OS. Um, and why use a slash in the name? Um, I guess because the marketing people did it. And was it annoying? To Pardon? deal with? Was it annoying to deal with? Um, no, we didn't have a directory called BSDOS um, since the whole thing was BSDOS. But, um, I will mention uh, why it got changed from BSD386 to BSDOS. Um, and that's because we had so many questions about when are you going to support 486? <laughs> <laughs> it already does, it always has. <laughs> it's just the system that it came from, so, so BSD OS, and uh, um, so BSD OS ended up um, running on i386, uh, well 486, uh, PowerPC, Spark, I think it was Spark 64, but I don't remember for sure. Um, we hired the people who did some of these. Um, well, the PowerPC port was done from scratch, I guess, but. So yeah, BSDI was targeting the embedded market um, as much as anything. Any other questions? We got one more. We got one more. All right. So the 
so the SMP code uh, BSDI contributed, this was for FreeBSD 3.0, the user land multi, this was for 5.0, the kernel multi, okay. Mm -hmm. Jack, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so, well, Mike. Um, I'll try to, best of my memory, try to describe what I remember of um, the code that we got from BSDOS 5. I don't know if it was a pre-release of 5 or actual 5.0. Um, it was probably a pre-release from I 5. Think, I feel like it was a pre-release. So I, I wasn't involved in the meeting, which turned out to be very ironic later on. Um, but I remember one of the things that was very kind of innovative and caused a lot of heartburn initially um, for FreeBSD trying to report the framework that BSDOS had adopted. Um, is y'all did some very interesting optimizations for interrupt threads. You had a, uh, you had first wrestled with the idea of running, using interrupt threads for handlers, and that's why FreeBSD adopted that same approach for um, not wanting to use, not having all mutexes block interrupts, but only certain uh, mutex is block interrupts and, and so and so in general for all the things that device driver interrupts want to interrupt handlers want to do like the like enter the network stack we didn't want to run all that with interrupts disabled or, or you didn't and, and we followed the same approach um so you wanted a thread context so that if you could block with a lock inside a, a device driver interrupt handler but you were very worried about the latency and extra full context which would impose on interrupts so you had some kind of crazy, you had an initial slow version, which is all FreeBSD got done, uh, which was to actually always do a full context switch. But then you had um, a system of, uh, you had like an optimized way that if at the time you took an interrupt, you could kind of borrow the stack, of the, the current thread and run for a while. And if it didn't actually do a context switch or do something kind of expensive, it would just stay on that stack and kind of defer and do a very cheap, simple context switch like just swap a few registers and call the function for the ISR. And then if the interrupt handler actually like blocked on a lock, then you had a way of unwinding it and kind of recovering gracefully in a way. Um, and we didn't port all that. That was a very complex thing that we, we never quite adopted. Um, but, but led to lots of internal discussions. Around this time, there was also, which was a FreeBSD quirk. Um, when Intel released Opinium, I guess they had done, or yeah, I guess it was Opinium 4. Opinion for. Um, they had done some kind of analysis to decide what instructions were worth optimizing versus which ones could maybe kind of be handled in a slower path like in microcode. And the, I guess the software they had profiled did not use the CLI instruction to disable interrupts. So that instruction was pretty slow. So there was a lot mm -hmm. of heartburn about the fact that in our, our naive version of, of interrupt threads, we would just disable interrupts with CLI. And there was all this stress and heartburn over trying to optimize for the Pinium 4 to not use this really slow instruction that the Pinium 3 and, and the successors, the core and so forth, didn't have this penalty problem. <laughs> so it ended up not being a, a, a thing to worry about. But I remember in FreeBSD land, that was very fresh, like a big source of contention in some of the early debates about how we should structure interrupt threads and so forth really centered around that type of stuff. I would say interrupts are among the trickiest subject in SMP at all. Um, certainly the previous interrupt strategy was not um, going to work in an SMP system. Oh, yes. um, the SMP work was mostly done by two people in Colorado Springs, mm -hmm. um, sort of coincidentally. They both worked from home, um, even though they were in the city where the office was, um, but engineers didn't go into the office <laughs> those days in VSDI. Because if the rest of us work from home in various places, why, why shouldn't they? Um, so um, one of the guys did a lot of the design stuff, um, and he had worked at Cray, um, or Cray Computer maybe, um, before he worked at BSGI. Um, Cray. Was that Chuck? No, that was um, Eric Versani. Oh, okay. uh, Chuck Patterson was the other one. Um, as an aside, um, Chuck Patterson worked for me for, I don't know, a year or a year and a half before I met him face to face. Um, wow. Since we both worked from home. And I may or may not have been in the Colorado Springs office, but he wasn't in the office. So, so he looked nothing like I expected, but that's to be expected, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, those guys were very good. Um, one of the things about a distributed company was that uh, we pretty much couldn't have junior engineers. 
um, pretty much everybody had to be self-sufficient. Um, and they were, we had a really great staff. Um, so um, basically if I didn't hear from somebody for a week, I assumed that they're making progress and not running into problems they couldn't handle. Um, Cause I had enough to do to uh, just kind of keep my head above water and deal with whatever problems did come up um, and dealing with other parts of the company. So, yeah, it was fun, but startups are a lot of work. <laughs> Well, it's not questions on IRC. There, there's people finding references to websites that may or may not be the right things. Um, Sorry? Uh, somebody, I think, claims they found, well, this S&P spec story on the FreeBSD side, but I don't think it's a question. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I talked to the, the two guys doing S&P with some regularity, and when they came to interesting design decisions, we'd talk. But mm -hmm. they pretty much ran on their own, and they were good enough that I could trust them to do that. And we had a lot of other stuff going on, so um, so two guys pretty much did it, which is fairly impressive. Um, I n I never ran the BSDI version in any kind of production. Um, I wasn't at BSDI anymore. Um, by the time they. Um, well, it wasn't BSDI, it was Wind River, but. Yeah, like, like I can attest that um, a good chunk of, well, it's moved around now. Um, but for example, the propagate priority function in the turnstile code that used to be in the mutex code is mostly a direct lift of what came out of the, the BSDOS code originally. Um, although, in, in, yeah, it was like sync mosh step that C under like sysci3536 um, in the drop that we got and then kind of got moved to be machine independent and around. But I still a lot of the structure and the way Mutex, Mutex's work is still pretty faithful and true to what we got from you guys to start with, so. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of tricky code in there. Um, yeah, I don't remember if I talked to them at the time they were doing the priority propagation. Um, wouldn't have been at the top of my list, but they may have run into enough problems without it that they figured they had to do it which wouldn't surprise me. Yep. And certainly when an interrupt thread needs a lock and exactly, something yeah. else holds it, um, you really kind of want that other thing to run to completion. So. Yeah, they, they got a lot done. Um, one of the other things that I was uh, proud of is the witness code. And I talked about doing the witness code. It was like, that's gonna be a lot of work, but you know maybe it's worth it, so go ahead. No, actually, that's that's actually something to call out because I know for a long time Linux didn't have something like that, um, and that was we, we brought witness over directly from BSDOS, and then at, when we added other types of locks, we made sure we added witness support for it, um, and it was very helpful. Like I can remember mm -hmm. Robert Watson talking about the fact that witness was a huge advantage, right. and that that is definitely straight from BSDOS. Yeah, it's certainly nice to know that deadly embraces are possible here. Yep. Without having to debug the deadly embrace. Yes, and not just between two. Like uh, I think even at the time, uh, the BSUS code had the con had the idea of like lock names, and so you didn't name like a process lock like by the PID, but they all shared the same name, so you could find potential relationships that you didn't have to have two physical locks reverse. You just had two locks of kind of the same logical class reverse, right. and you could find and it was very helpful. So, yeah, that, was, that, that was something that was basically unsafe in the original system. Yep. Having two locks of the same type. But yep. it, unless you defined an ordering, it's, yes. it's going to collide eventually. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank Mike. <laughs>